Hey everyone, welcome back to Crown Corner, the channel where we dive into the wild world of entitled people and their unbelievable stories. Hope you enjoy it, and without further ado, let's go. First, some backstory. My close family has been plagued by an annoying and entitled Karen, who was actually my father's grandmother. I never really liked my father's side of our extended family, except for his mother, who was an angel, and his grandfather, but that's not relevant to the story. However, this poor excuse for a woman, who we'll call Karen K., has crossed many lines over the last few years. Now, I wasn't the only one who didn't like her. Most of our family kind of hated her, mainly for the things she's done in the past one to two years. I'll get to that a bit later. Looking back at her behavior, I'd say she must have gone completely crazy at some point. Although, I guess I can't really blame her because she apparently lost an apartment and a lot of money after she broke up with a man she fell in love with, who somehow convinced her to give him a lot of her stuff and real estate. Now, the story I'm about to tell you happened in our big two-story family house in which I lived together with my two brothers, my mom, my dad, my grandfather, and my great-grandmother, Karen's sister and also in our fairly large garden with a gazebo. This will be important later. Karen used to live in our country's capital city, and our house is located in a quaint town in the north of the country, about 120 kilometers from the capital city. Ever since she broke up with her boyfriend, and lost basically everything, although it's kind of her fault, she's been acting strange, and as I said, I think she must have gone crazy, as far as I know, she became homeless soon after and started traveling between the capital city, our town, and other nearby towns, begging, I suppose. I actually saw her begging in the city where I attended high school, so yes, I know for sure she's been begging even before our little story happened. Even before the main incident, there have been many minor incidents involving Karen. She used to stay at our house from time to time, even before she became homeless, and one day, my grandfather noticed there was a jacket missing. I don't know if it was expensive or not, but either way, the jacket disappeared just as Karen was leaving our house one day. I'm quite sure she eventually admitted she stole it. Other incidents involved her asking her sister, who's in her 80s now, for money or stealing some other stuff from our house. Anyway, onto the story. As I said, there's a gazebo in our garden, and one rainy afternoon, Karen decided to break into our garden and take a nap in it. To be fair, a bit of the fence was missing because we were making some adjustments to the garden, so it wasn't hard to get in, but that still doesn't mean you can just walk into our garden and spend the night there, right? Anyway, my brother and I were in our room, which overlooks the garden. Suddenly, my brother gestured for me to come and have a look. There she was, Karen, in all her glory, getting comfy in our garden, I hardly ever take the initiative, as I'm quite introverted, but this time someone was invading my home turf. I guess my primal instinct somehow kicked in. Anyway, I put on my jacket and went outside. When I got to the gazebo, my grandfather was already there, shouting at Karen. There's not much dialogue, and it might not be very accurate, but the main idea and the outcome are still the same. Grandad. If you don't get the heck out of here, I'll call the police. Now I remember Karen's voice as this hellish screeching high-pitched noise ever since I was little. I haven't really seen this woman too many times, but I know she used to visit us when I was little. She was a normal human being at that point. Karen, go on call them, this house is mine just as much as it's yours. I should clarify that this house apparently used to belong to Karen at some point, but we bought it a long time ago. She didn't even own a single brick in this house when this happened. Grandad, that's nonsense we bought it years ago. My grandfather then went and called the police while I was trying to calmly tell her to leave. Me, Karen just leave, you can't stay here. Karen kept sitting in the gazebo, still getting comfy and shouting, calling us names. You get the point. A few minutes later, two policemen arrived at our house. Grandad, there she is pointing at Karen. She's trespassing, this is private property. Karen to Grandad. Is this how you repay me, after everything I've done for you? 
she didn't really do anything for my granddad or for our family in general, as far as I know. The two police officers were just standing there. I don't want to call them useless, so I hope they were at least listening to the story and watching the situation, although they did look quite uninterested in the whole ordeal. Karen. Ungrateful jerks all of you, is this how you treat an old helpless woman? Karen kept calling us names, and it looked like she had no intentions of moving off our property. Police officer 1. Ma'am, you have to leave. This is private property, and if the others don't want you here, you can't stay here. Karen. But this is my house, I have the right to stay here. She kept shouting stuff like this ever since the police officers arrived. Police officer 2, ma'am, you have to leave, come with us. They didn't handcuff her or anything, but I'm pretty sure my grandfather helped her leave by dragging her off the property. Either way, she left without the involvement of the police, really. I guess the police officers were kind of useless after all. While she was roaming our street, she kept screaming and slandering us in front of our neighbors and nearby passers-by. After this incident, and actually before it also, Karen used to bang at our front door from time to time, demanding to see her sister, my senile great-grandmother, who kept on helping her despite what she's done to us and to herself. Karen kept on harassing us until we pressed charges against her for harassing and disturbing us, and she finally stopped after this process ended. Edit. To some people, our behavior may seem heartless, but it really isn't, since there's only so much we could put up with. Despite her being basically a stranger to us, we offered her more than enough help, but she basically just spat in our faces and refused professional help. My brothers and I never really considered her as a family member, and I'm sure the older generations, our parents for example, didn't either. This is the tale of how an entitled and borderline sociopathic classmate of mine had her academic life ruined before it had even started over some petty nonsense. Allow me to introduce her. I'll call her Karen Jr. Karen Jr. was a pretty decent student who made equally decent grades. Certainly nothing to scoff at. However, she didn't take any particularly hard classes, and it seemed as if she was merely skating through high school, waiting for the greater things in life. She was also a mythic witch. She had money, and often flaunted it. She looked down on kids who didn't have as much as she did, and was a classic case of spoiled jerk syndrome. She also had a habit of sending her mom on anyone who dared to rub her the wrong way. Let's talk about her. Her mom worked at the school as a math teacher and was very chummy with most of the other teachers, as well as the administration of both the school and the local county board. She was also a jerk. She would intentionally fail high-achieving students who might make her precious daughter look worse in the long run. We'll call this teacher Karen. As for myself, I was a senior in high school at the time of all of this, class of 2019. I am currently a college sophomore. In high school, I was one of the top students in the class. My undergraduate studies have been entirely paid for by academic scholarships, and I was one of a handful who were poised to be valedictorian for our class. Of course, this title didn't mean much to me. I worked very hard for scholarship money, not for some silly title. I'm saying this now not to brag but because it's important to the story later. It's also important to note that this story takes place in the thick of college admission season. Seniors were scrambling to write essays, get important documents together, and raise standardized test scores before it was all said and done. I mostly only ever had class with Karen Jr. when I was taking courses required to graduate. These weren't hard classes at all, and certainly were not weighted. Typically, my other classes would be advanced placement or dual credit courses to academically challenge myself and to raise my GPA for scholarships. I rarely had class with Karen Jr. in any of these courses, and the class size was so small for APs at my school that if she had been, we would have been in the same class for sure. This was very odd, as she struck me as capable of handling the course load. That's when the crazy show began. You see, Karen Jr., like many other folks at this time, had also been trying to raise her test scores for college admissions. She claimed that she had anxiety, and as a result, she got some special accommodations whenever it was time to take tests, 
both for classes and standardized tests. However, she was notoriously extroverted in class discussions and never struck me as the nervous type. I have dealt with generalized anxiety disorder for years, and I wasn't buying it. I also didn't want to use this as a cop-out to get special privileges. But if that's what the psychologist's note said, I didn't have an issue with it. For regular class tests, this meant that she got to leave the room and take her tests somewhere else. She typically went to the library, where she could take it in a more isolated setting. There was a rare situation where we did share a class, AP US government. The teacher was also great friends with Karen. At my high school, it was known as one of the easier AP classes, due to the heavy focus on vocabulary and the lack of challenging concepts. We had tests there on a two-week basis, after covering the material in the textbook. I would study very hard for each and every test, and I always ended up with low A's. This was fine in my book, since the other assignments would keep my grade above the 95 mark, as per usual. Karen Jr. would leave class every two weeks to take the test. That was all well and good, until she got a 100% on every single test. She's a capable student, but she's certainly no genius. She would also flaunt to her friends how she never studies for any of her tests because she just gets it. This continued for the first little bit of the course, until one test day. The library was closed down after some water damage had been uncovered after a pretty bad storm. She couldn't take the test in the library, as usual, and had to take it with the rest of us. She seemed hesitant, but the teacher insisted that there was nowhere else suitable in the school for test-taking, and so she took the test, and gloriously bombed it. I don't know exactly what she got, but she had shed a few tears as soon as she saw her grade. She claimed that it had been misgraded by the Scantron, and insisted that it was re-scored. She got the same score. I assumed that it was due to her anxiety and I felt bad for her. That sympathy went away in an instant when, during class, she whispered to one of her friends that she'd always go to her mom's classroom instead of the library to take her tests. I always had a skill for eavesdropping, since I was a relatively unassuming person who didn't say much in class. I didn't know what this meant for sure, but I assume her mom, Karen, had looked up the answers for it, that explained immediately why she had gotten perfect scores on the previous tests, and why she had bombed this one. However, her blatant cheating didn't affect me one bit, so I turned a blind eye and kept doing my own thing. Then, the situation escalated a bit. See, her anxiety also allowed her some special privileges for taking standardized college placement exams, like the ACT and SAT. One of my friends had a sister who genuinely had a learning disability and absolutely needed the extra time. She was incredibly sweet. We'll call the sister Destiny. Destiny explained to me that when you present to the ACT testing facility with accommodations, you had two options. You could either take each of the four ACT sections, five sections if you took it with writing, on separate days under normal time constraints, or take all of the sections on the same day with double the time on each section. Destiny also explained that all test takers with accommodations took the exam on the same day, different from normal test takers, so that they could ensure that each student's needs could be met. Destiny mentioned how Karen Jr. got a special room to take her tests in, not unlike her regular tests. That's all well and good, she thought. Except when Destiny finished her exams, she noticed that Karen Jr. hadn't finished with the rest of the students. She assumed this meant that Karen Jr. had opted for the extended time option. Until on Karen Jr.'s social media, she posted about how she was ready for day two inches of ACT testing. Sure enough, she had taken it over the course of several days. All of this meant that somehow, Karen Jr. had taken the ACT with both accommodation options. I was never sure how this was possible, but in retrospect, it was probably her mom. Karen Jr. got a spectacular score on her exam, something like a 32 or 33. Again, this didn't particularly bother me. Her test scores didn't affect me one bit. I decided to take the information with a laugh and move on with my life. This is when things went from annoying to personal. You see, several students, including myself, were in the running to be our class's valedictorian. 
I didn't care too much, since the distinction wouldn't have gotten me any extra money from the college I was planning on attending. It was quite a shock to learn that Karen Jr., beyond a shadow of a doubt, was going to be our valedictorian for that year. To me, and many others, this seemed impossible. She hadn't taken nearly as many weighted classes as the lot of us, and was a good student at best. Also, Karen Jr.'s best friend was lined up to be salutatorian second in class rank. She was also a pretty mediocre student. So how did they both manage to get a higher GPA than us? We had been taking APs since freshman year. The answer came to me as I was eating lunch one day. One of my friends, we'll call him Aaron, had been making up a calculus test in Karen's room. While he was there, he had overheard some seriously juicy information. Karen was looking at the student transcripts of high-ranking students, including myself, and had arranged for Karen Jr.'s schedule to inflate her GPA so much that it passed my own and the GPA of other hard-working students. This included taking some online classes from a local college, which I was never permitted to take. This is because the classes were so specific that the credits didn't transfer. We're talking about a college class about proper walking exercising techniques here. Easy stuff. What's more concerning is that these student transcripts contained very sensitive information that included, but was not limited to, the last four digits of social security, home addresses, phone numbers, medical history, approved medication, and academic records of all kinds. Why they'd openly whisper about this stuff with another student in the room was beyond me. I didn't want to take this information at face value, so I looked up the list of faculty that had permission to access student transcript information in the first place. Only a handful of teachers could do this. Wouldn't you believe that Karen's name was most certainly on the list? I also ran the numbers myself. It was totally possible to arrange a schedule of dumb classes that would exceed everyone else's GPA. The same had been done to Karen Jr.'s best friend's schedule, just not to the same extent. I was livid. That was my personal information, which, if leaked, could cause some serious privacy issues. Part of my SSN was on there, for God's sake. So I decided that I wasn't gonna take this lying down anymore. I looked up the regulations and codes regarding the share of a student transcript without consent, and woo boy, all of that stuff is under FERPA law, and if you don't know anything about FERPA, just know that they don't mess around in the slightest. The state penalties alone for sharing student documents with a third party without consent, either from the parent, if the student is under 18, or the student itself, was a hefty fine, possible termination, and further federal penalties. We're talking jail time if the information shared led to consequences for the student whose information was shared. All I needed was proof. Along with Aaron's testimony, I wanted irrevocable proof that Karen and Karen Jr. were doing shady stuff. So I hatched a plan. I was in the show choir, and so I had access to some decent recording equipment, including some single-use audio recorders. These were used by judges during competitions to give quick feedback on the show, and also for student auditions. They were small, discreet, and silent. They also had a neat feature where you could set a timer on the thing to tell it to start recording after so much time had passed. I set the timer so that the recorder would start during lunch. Before school one day, I went up to Karen's room to glance briefly and see if she was in there. She was not, and her room was not locked. Her classroom was on the second floor, so the stairwell door downstairs alone was locked at night. However, they unlocked these doors before school so that janitors could do spot cleaning before normal class hours. I taped one of these recorders under her chair, set the timer for around lunchtime, and her planning period. They were back to back, and waited. I went back at the end of the day, I had choir practice, and retrieved the recorder before the downstairs doors were locked. They left them unlocked for extracurricular activities because freshman and sophomore lockers were upstairs. I got home and began playing the tape. Bingo. I had my irrefutable evidence. It was all there. Conversations about Karen viewing student transcripts and disclosing that information with a third party, Karen Jr. Now I have another problem. You see, Karen was extremely friendly with the administration. So I had to find someone who I knew would take me seriously, 
and would cooperate while keeping my identity a secret. Fortunately, my counselor, we were each assigned one based on our last name, was a real stand-up guy, and I knew he'd come in clutch. I went with Aaron to his office, and I took my laptop with the audio file backed up onto it. We presented our case. You see, to file a FERPA violation report, you needed the administration of the organization. This included my counselor, to go on record saying that the complaint was legitimate and that further investigation was warranted. The complaint was also anonymous. He gave me his sweet, sweet approval on the form. I filed the complaint and waited. The fallout was glorious. The school's administration was forced to do an objective audit on all of Karen's activity at the school, where they confirmed that all of this nonsense had been taking place. Karen Jr.'s valedictorian status and her friend's salutatorian were sacked, and some other, more deserving kid was presented with the honor. I myself was awarded salutatorian, although this didn't matter to me too much. The school was fined by FERPA for a breach of policy, and Karen got fired. I graduated before all of that took place. But it doesn't end there. During the audit, they also found evidence that Karen Jr. had been coming to her mom's room during regular tests and copying down answers from the internet, and she faced severe disciplinary action for that. That certainly wouldn't look good on her record. We're talking in-school suspension due to multiple documented violations. The icing on the cake was when they discovered the mess regarding her ACT accommodations. Turns out, her mom had been pulling the strings behind the scenes to get her accommodations for that anxiety we talked about earlier. The ACT company takes cheating very seriously, and so they voided her pristine standardized testing score, which had landed her a full scholarship to her university of choice. The same ended up happening with some of her SAT and AP scores as well. For reasons that I never personally discovered, Karen Jr. lost all of her scholarship money from the university and ended up attending an in-state college that took the few scores that were not voided and also weren't fraudulent. Those scores probably weren't near as good as her voided ones. All of this news was absolutely buzzing around the school, and Karen Jr. was disgraced. I did my part in my graduation ceremony a few months later, and all was well. I never intended it to go so far, but I don't feel bad one bit. Revenge is sweet and best served by FERPA. Thanks for listening. I live in a shared house with three rooms, and out of everyone, I have been living there the longest. One of my flatmates, who I'll call Karen, spends 24-7 at her boyfriend's place and only comes to the house once in a while to get clothes and do laundry. The other flatmate is a new guy, around 50 years old, and he's been bothering me by breaking a few house rules. Out of respect for everyone, we have some rules like always clean up after yourself, don't leave personal stuff around the house in the common areas, and don't make noise after 10 p.m. Pretty standard stuff. The new guy decided he's special, and uses up all the kitchen counter space by leaving his groceries out, leaving cooked food in plates and containers without lids on the counter, or leaving pots full of food on the stove. When someone else wants to cook or use the space, you need to move his stuff or ask him to do it, which he does with a sour face. One day at work, one of my co-workers was disgusted by what she thought were mice droppings, but in reality it was black rice that someone spilled after eating poke. At that moment, a light bulb appeared over my head. The first thing I did was go to the grocery store and buy a pack of black rice. I went home, spread a few near his groceries and pots without lids, and let his mind do the rest. The next morning, I found the new guy in the kitchen, looking stressed. New guy, did you see this? We have mice. Me, mice really where? New guy. Look at these droppings, they're everywhere. I can't believe this. I looked at the black rice with a straight face, trying not to laugh. Me. That's disgusting, we need to do something about this. He immediately started telling everyone there was a mice infestation at the house. He never left food on the counter again, and even set a few mouse traps in his part of the cupboard. It was very funny to see him check the traps every day, finding them empty. A few days later, I ran into Karen when she came by to pick up some clothes. Karen, hey, I heard we have mice now? Me. Yeah, the new guy thinks so, he found some droppings in the kitchen. Karen, 
That's weird, I've never seen any mice here. Me. Me neither, but he's convinced. Maybe it'll teach him to clean up after himself. Karen laughed, and we shared a knowing look. We both knew the truth, but it was working out perfectly. The new guy had finally stopped leaving his stuff all over the kitchen. A week passed, and the new guy was still obsessed with the mice. One evening, as I was making dinner, he came into the kitchen with a serious look on his face. New guy. I've set traps everywhere, but I haven't caught a single mouse. Do you think they're smart enough to avoid them? Me. Maybe. Or maybe there aren't as many as you think. Just keep the kitchen clean and they'll have no reason to hang around. New guy. You're right, I've been keeping my food sealed and cleaning up right after I cook. I hope it helps. Me. I'm sure it will. Seeing him look at the empty traps every day was a small victory. Me and the other roommate, who knew what was really going on, were very pleased with the outcome. The house was cleaner, and it was very funny to watch the new guy's paranoia. I couldn't have asked for a better result. We've been in our house now for a couple of years. It's set back from the main road with a bungalow in front of us, and a two-story building overlooking both properties. We have a large hedge, about seven feet high and twenty feet long, running down our drive that blocks the two-story building from overlooking our neighbor's back garden. The neighbors in the front garden have paved their back garden and have very little maintenance apart from trimming their side of the hedge. They are both retired. We have quite a large garden that's fairly high maintenance, but I try to keep on top of most jobs. The neighbors in front will be out moaning if I don't keep the top of the hedge neatly trimmed, even though I've explained that I have the rest of the garden to maintain. After years of their moaning, I finally decided to rip the hedge out and replace it with a five-foot-high chicken wire fence while they were on holiday. I was in the kitchen yesterday with the window open when they got back from holiday. I heard them moaning and swearing as they realized what I had done. Can't wait to bump into them. Updates. For people who seem to think I have destroyed what little bit of greenery I have, we still have at least 100 feet of hedging. A mixture of privet, leylandy, which I keep to about 8 feet, and laurel. We have two large ponds, full of frogs and newts, an area where we have left for nature to do its own thing, and we have a few trees. The garden is full of wildlife. Today, the neighbor actually came around complaining about the hedge. Karen, what have you done to the hedge? Me. I replaced it with a chicken wire fence. The hedge was getting too much to maintain. Karen. Are you going to replace it with a fence large enough to give us back our privacy? Me. That's your problem. I've done my best to keep it trimmed but it was too much. Karen. I'm going to complain to the council. Me. Do what you need to do. She stormed off, clearly upset. Honestly, I feel relieved. That hedge was a constant source of stress and I'm glad it's gone. Let's see what the council has to say about it. So this just happened on my lunch break as I drove to the other side of town to cash in my scratcher. By other side of town, I mean across the invisible border that separates areas that can sell scratchers and areas that can't. Tribal grounds don't sell scratchers or lottery tickets at convenience stores. I drove to this place because I wanted a soda and some snacks, you know, a healthy lunch for a teacher, and usually don't go here unless I want need lottery. It's a cool-looking little mom-and-pop place, but the second I stepped in the cashier just gave me an icy stare for some reason. A little background. I have three of my five children on the autism Asperger's spectrum, and though I myself was never diagnosed as a child, I can guarantee that I have similar tendencies, and I have a feeling that my lack of proper eye contact might have something to do with the cashier's high noon stare a realization that came to me the second I typed it. As I was walking into the place, I contemplated cashing the scratcher. Five bucks yay right away, but decided I'd wait until I got my stuff and then cash it at the same time. In this indecisiveness I found myself fumbling around in my pockets and feeling to make sure I had my car keys. A nervous habit that I have I probably check once every 15 minutes whether I'm at home, on the road or sometimes even sleeping. I can't tell you how many times I checked my pockets, but I can tell you that someone staring at me increases the frequency. I picked my items mentally, but yet again checked my pockets to see if I had enough change plus the $5 to pay for the items. 
it felt like I had enough, and I want to use this as a math problem for my students. If I had 17 coins, only dimes and quarters, and it was a total of $3.05, how many of each coin did I have, as I return even? I'm deep in thought about this problem when I hear yelling or something that sounds like blah 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 police. Love you like a father, John Mullaney. I look up and see a lady right in my face. Oh heck, I'd be horrible in a bank robbery. Presumably repeating herself, saying, Empty your pockets or I'm calling the police. She didn't have generalized pronunciation issues, but she for some reason super emphasized the end syllable. Just don't know how to properly depict that. It was borderline funny, and I kind of laughed as I started to comply simultaneously with the moment she took her gnarly little smoky fingers and dug her nails into my arm. She had to reach up. I'm six feet three. She's not. I like to consider my pain threshold pretty good, but this chick was seriously hurting me, trying to drag me to some place. I just went along with her, told her calm down here, as I pulled super sharply away from her increasingly painful grasp. She yelled at me again, empty your pockets, and then to some empty air call the police. Time for malicious compliance, as quick as I can manage. I took this moment to think to myself, oh heck, I better empty my pockets right now before this gets out of hand. It was already way out of hand, it just took me a beat to realize. I quickly started emptying my pockets, which had 32 pieces of a ripped up scratcher, three receipts, two of which showed me my hours at Mendy's. One was to a car wash or something, my wallet, a straw wrapper, and with everything I took out of my pockets I smacked it on her checkout area individually saying, see, this isn't your crap, and this isn't your crap, this, oh wait, no it's also not your crap, and when I got through almost everything, I skipped a few with the scratcher pieces, and finally ended with the scratcher I was going to cash in there. I realized that I was acting out of anger and physical pain, and should probably take it down a notch. I took this opportunity to thoroughly enjoy the dastardly malice inherent in placing an assortment of ripped up papers upon a counter. Her entire counter was covered in absolute garbage, mixed with about 5% of the surface area representing stuff I need. I'm a chipmunk what can I say? Now she's got a mess to clean up but that's just the beginning. I then started emptying my shirt pocket which had my teacher id, my pens, my whiteboard marker. Yes I keep all this in my shirt pocket, and yes I wear a button-up chaps shirt over my jeans. I then put my arms spread out as if to say would you like to check anywhere else, I'm clean. She just kept shaking her head at me, shaking her head to someone off in the distance, and then the cops rolled up, I can't believe she actually called, had someone call, the police. As the car pulled up, I just couldn't explain to you how glorious this was, because we the lady and I both had satisfying grins on our collective faces. Her, because she thought I was done for, and subsequently told me, now we'll really search you. And me, because it's none other than my school's SRO, resource officer who just so happened to get the call somehow. I was bleeding through my shirt and I could feel it, I don't know how this was even scientifically possible, and if I read someone write this I wouldn't believe it, but swear to God she broke the skin through my polo shirt. What in the actual? Anyway, Officer Gold walks in, and I was about to let on that I knew him by addressing him by name, thank God I didn't because not a good look, but he beat me to the punch by saying, Davis, you holding up another liquor store? with that dopey smile he always has. I told him, hey I emptied my pockets, you're willing to search me just. Officer Gold, Rich, that won't be necessary. I can see your pockets are empty did she watch you empty them is there a camera? He just continued rattling off his cop spiel. The sun beaming through his glasses from the opposite side, offering a ray of hope, then turning to the lady, ma'am, can I ask you a few questions, at which time he returned to me about to tell me something when he sees my arm and says, how the HLL did that happen? I thought, yeah you might want to check the camera on that one too, but just looked directly at the lady to indicate the answer we both already knew. He then turned to the lady, and told her to follow him, had her perp walked to the outside of the store, when immediately, a kid came running out to her defense with a steady stream of energy drinks clumsily clunking behind, and Gold turned toward him, 
and had him sit down next to his mom on the curb outside. By this time a second police car had arrived at the scene, had an exchange with Officer Gold, and Gold spoke with the mom while the new officer came to talk with me. She asked me the typical questions, like when I got there, whether I'd been there earlier in the day, I hadn't, if I knew her or the son before today, etc. I guess thinking about it it wasn't exactly a streamlined series of questions but whatever. The truth is like a priceless gem surrounded by muddy crap. The face on Rosie, when she realized she was the one about to go with the police instead of me, that was priceless. I saw her sitting in the back of the squad car. She was repeatedly shaking her head in anger, flailing about and she had a flood of tears flowing down. My late husband's ex-wife is a crazy person, and I never thought I'd have to deal with someone like her. When we first met, he told me that his last relationship was a bad experience that he wanted to forget. He never liked saying bad things about people, but he did say, that was a very bad time in my life, and I'd like to leave it in the past. As we got to know each other better, he told me more about her. She had been unfaithful to him and tried to get him to start a family with her. There were whispers that one of her lovers might have made her pregnant. On top of that, she left him with a huge amount of debt. Before she left the country, she used up all of their credit cards. He was left to clean up the mess, which kept her mess from hurting his credit score. She came back into the picture uh, about a year before I did, trying to get back in touch through common friends. To get away from her, my husband had to change his number twice. The second time, he cut off people who had given her his new phone number. It looked like he was finally done with her, but then she found my phone number. I didn't know what to do when she called. How did she know my phone number? Why did she want to talk to me? Her voice sounded nice enough, but I've had to deal with more manipulative family members than her. She tried to get us to like each other by saying that we both had great taste in men, but I could tell that her words had a hidden meaning that she was trying to plant seeds of doubt in my mind. She started trying to be my friend by saying she was a member of the sisterhood and felt forced to tell me a secret before we got too close. I let her talk because I was interested in how much she was lying. After the call was over, I noticed a small change in the people my husband and I were friends with. Her group of friends shrunk probably because she was always trying to get into our lives. Even though we blocked and avoided her, she kept trying to hurt our relationship. She never stopped making herself out to be the victim and us out to be the bad guys, but what she did only made our friendship stronger. We had been through hard times together and came out of them unharmed. As time went on, my husband died in a very sad way. A friend called me and hesitated before asking if I had seen that day's Facebook post. It was a long, tearful dedication from his ex-girlfriend on his memorial page. She talked about how much she missed her soulmate, and showed pictures from when they got engaged and when they got married. Her words were full of lies, and she said things that were not true about how she felt. I was filled with anger and rage. How dare she change his memory to make it fit her story. I removed her from the group and erased the post right away. But the harm was already done. Again, my group of friends got smaller as I cut ties with people who had shown concern or helped her. It was hard to decide but it was the right thing to do for my own health. Even though she had made a mess, I wouldn't let her win. I turned my sadness into resolve because I knew my husband wouldn't have wanted her to have this much power over us. I relied on the real friends and family who stayed, the ones who saw through her act and stood by my side. Over time, I found a strength I didn't know I had. I saw that her deception came from her own feelings of insecurity and envy. She couldn't move on with her life because she was stuck in the past. On the other hand, I was making a future for myself that wasn't affected by her poison. I started to think about how to honor my husband's memory in real ways, with people who really cared. I reminisced about the good times I had with friends who had stuck by me. I told them stories and told them about my favorite memories. Slowly but surely, the darkness she had cast over his mind started to fade. In the end, her efforts to control, manipulate, and lie fell apart completely. Life went on, and I took the lessons I'd learned from this event with me. I learned how important it is to be real, and to never let someone else's plans shape my life.
Thank you for joining us. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe for more captivating stories. Share your own experiences and opinions in the comments below, and let's keep the conversation going. Until next time, stay tuned for more epic tales.